companies can now use to optimize things like rewards, to optimize things like training and development. HR and the way companies communicate with employees is going to be based on personalization. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everybody, Ben Eubanks here, host of We're Only Human, and so glad to have you here as part of the conversation. I don't always get the chance to bring back a guest who's been on the show in the past, but when I do, it is always a treasure for me because I get a chance to dive deeper, ask more questions, and you all know, as well as anybody who's listened before, that I love just pursuing my curiosity in these different areas. And so today, I'm excited to talk about culture because back when I worked in the HR space, that was one of the, my favorite conversations to have with our leaders. How do we make our culture more concrete, more understandable, more actionable? And we're going to talk about those things today with someone who I see as one of the leading experts in culture in our space. So Juan Betancourt from Human Intelligence is here. We're going to dive into those things. And again, you might remember Juan was in a previous episode. Where we talked about one of their amazing case studies with, with, where they were where they used some of the tools to get better attention, better results, better impact on the business. So that was a fun episode. I'll make sure and link that in the show notes. And without any further ado, Juan, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Ben. A real pleasure to be back. Been following everything you've been doing and producing since the last show. And thanks again for your thought leadership in the space of human resources and, and obviously what we touch on, which is tools, technology that impact culture. Okay. Well, go, go deeper than that. So for those of the audience that are new that haven't heard Juan before, give them a little snippet about who you are and what you do. Small company, about 20 people, been around for six years, has some major clients like Coca-Cola, Lyft, Bank of the West, Honda, a few others, BASF. And, and we also have lots of small companies, right? Probably 80% are under 200 employees. And so culture is something that impacts everyone. And culture is something that has been very vague and fluffy for 50 years. But as we all know, the famous phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And most business and most software has started to quantify and measure everything around productivity and different things. We're the innovative leaders who are putting analytics and data and measurement to culture so it's not fluffy, so that it can impact performance, where then HR does get a seat at the table, not because they just should, because in theory, oh, every C-suite should, but because they now can improve performance and profitability as much as the CFO, as much as a PL leader, okay? And so our tagline is, we are human intelligence, the culture software. We help companies measure culture manage it, what we call CAS, culture as a service, and then hire for it, whether you're trying to clone what you have or guarantee diversity of thought and have what UKG calls culture ad. And so we do all of those things and we do it in a scalable way. We, the way we get the insights on culture are through personality tests, assessments, but unlike the last 60 years of those, which are really individual self-awareness tools, you know, where your strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots, we aggregate the data and use technology, AI, and soon machine learning to figure out insights that drive everything that a company can do to perform better. And it's really powerful. It is the future and anything measurable, if you can't measure it, it can't improve. Mm -hmm. Companies that believe that their culture and their people are important, they're not actually measuring it. And they're just only putting it on coffee mugs and putting it on t-shirts and having people memorize it in the little booklets. Those companies aren't going to perform very well. What I love about our conversations is we're going to, that yield can feel very stuffy, right? And static because that's just the legacy there, right? Lots of science, lots of data. And finally, the tools are catching up to the ability to really help this become a more dynamic conversation to actually measure this stuff, which again, 10 years ago, if you said you can measure your culture, someone probably would have laughed at you. Today, it's reality. It's coming to doing it. So you listed a couple of those that are forward thinking that are actually tackling that kind of stuff. So what I'm, I'm hoping to do with you today this is my fun little thought exercise, and I think it's going to help the people in the audience because we're talking about measuring something that for a lot of companies still is this thing that's hard to get your arms around. It's hard to define. And so I want to walk through some different talent practices that every single company uses, so common practices, recruiting, onboarding, those kinds of things. And I'll give you one, and then I want us to talk a little bit about how to weave some culture understanding, some culture measurement, to, you know, culture pieces of that into that conversation. So it's not just recruiting, it's this, this 
rigid process over here, but we also have a layer of culture within that. And we're thinking about how to weave that into other things. Is that fair? Perfect. Okay, awesome. So we'll start with that first one, right? That someone's gonna come in the door. So let's talk about recruiting a little bit. Internal recruiting, external recruiting doesn't care. I don't really care, but we're gonna bring somebody into the business. Talk about weaving culture into that. So it's not just a lift of what can Juan do, but who is Juan and how does he fit into or add to what we're trying to do here? Yeah, so I'll bring it real, bring it to a real tangible example. These convenience stores like 7-Eleven at gas stations or yeah. Quick Trip, right? So we're in deep discussions with one right now that has over 30,000 employees across all the states. And they have their stated culture as a company, but they realize that they have high turnover and they realize that store managers don't know how to hire to that culture. And they don't even know if that culture is truly going to perform if they actually do hire to it. And so they are doing a pilot right now where they are looking at the culture of, let's just use uh, let's just use 7-Eleven. It's, that's not the company, but let's say 7-Eleven has five employees in all of their stores around the country, five, 10,000 stores, right? In Hialeah or Doral, Florida, where it's all Latin customers and Latin employees, the culture of performance in those 7-Eleven stores is very different than what a culture of high performance up in Boston, where it's probably more Anglo versus Laredo, Texas, which is probably more Hispanic as well. And inner city Philly, where it might be more urban and African-American, the culture of performance of the, what, what leads to a great net promoter customer experience is very different. And so yes. you would, what they are doing is they're taking our personality test, our self-assessment, giving it to the five employees at all the 10 stores in the region and seeing who are the, the top three or four stores and who are the bottom stores and what is a high performing culture? What does it look like? So that we have, we measure 28 characteristics, whether people are decisive or deliberate and behaviors, whether they're innovative or less innovative, more service oriented and, and motivators. And then the third area is work styles, whether they like to be structured work environment or creative. And so let's say they have a real process driven structured environment, but they want decisive self-starters in the store who are really good at helping and self in service. They can literally codify that in 10 minutes, have it in, you know, in a software where then all the employees take this test, it'll tell them if they have that or not. And then they'll see the results, right? From the last six months. And it'll tell them stores A, B, and C look like this culturally, that's high performance. Stores D, E, and F, don't have that culture, they have a different one, those people are probably not the right fit. You need to recreate what you have stores A, B, and C. And so you can look at culture. There's not one culture at a company across the country, right? Even Coca-Cola, their finance and accounting team has a very different culture than their marketing team. And Coca-Cola Mexico is different than Coca-Cola Ireland versus Coca-Cola China. And so we're the first company to, with data to prove that there is not one culture. And unless a company can measure it at a local level, like a 7-Eleven in different parts of Florida versus Jacksonville and Miami, different cultures for the same business operations called convenience store at 7-Eleven, you're going to have different results, right? And even different demographics. Like the culture of employees who work the midnight shift to 6 a.m., the night Night shift, wouldn't you think you have a different mentality and different way of being and what motivates people than people who work from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m.? You bet you they do, right? Like it's a different profile, right? It's not just like Starbucks. We have a barista profile. We'll hire everyone like baristas. If you've ever watched Starbucks work in a store and you're there in line, I guess this is BC before COVID. We used to go to Starbucks. It's really intense back there. They're really working hard and you have different profiles, different personalities. And probably if you hired everyone to be the same at a Starbucks, it's like hiring a basketball team with all point guards. Probably wouldn't do so well. Whereas at Starbucks that you have lots of different personalities and a diverse culture, diversity of thought, diversity of behaviors, diversities of ways of interacting with the customer in line. You, you need some decisive people. You need some patient people, right? In a Starbucks, you need to mirror the diversity that's coming to your store I bet you if Starbucks ever did this test, high performing stores at Starbucks probably don't have a cookie cutter profile for barista. They probably actually, the highest performing ones have a more diverse thinking group. And our tool allows you to either clone what works for high performance, like in a call center, you probably want to clone or hire for diversity of thought in certain retail, hotel, hospitality, and, and manufacturing environments. I'm glad you broke that out, especially at the very end, about that two different sets of options, because the, that's the problem I hear most often people talk about. You talk about culture and how do we how to use that as a mechanism for hiring. People are like, oh, but we don't want to be biased against people, and that's absolutely true. We don't want to just, we don't want to carbon copy every single person, 
But when it comes to some of the things you're talking about here, it's not about we're picking you because of your skin color, we're picking you because of your gender, we're picking you because if you have these capabilities, these competencies, and we're looking for those types of things in you. And that's what we're bringing to the table. And those things don't know any age bounds, any gender bounds, any things like that. So that's the, I'm glad you brought that piece up because I wanted to make sure we hit that and funk well, that shit. Funny, before it funny you say that. Our, our hottest segment right now of buyers are chief diversity officers. Because up until now, what actually is happening is every store manager, every retail officer, every person hiring, they actually are being biased in their hiring. They're hiring people they like, which means they're hiring people just like them. So the April 2019 Harvard Business Review, HBR, front page um, call, is called The Culture Factory. It holds a bunch of pictures of penguins on it, if you find that it's penguins on the cover. And it's all around cascading thought where leaders are incapable of hiring people they don't like, meaning hiring people who are different. So what you end up having is 90% of every team in the company is actually mirrors the hiring manager. So that is the problem today. It is subjective. People hire who they like. Can you imagine telling a, a team, okay, you got 100 applicants, you phone screen 20, you got five who came in for final rounds, okay? We want to hire the most diverse thinking person that's culture adds your team. So when you interview those final five group of six people on the team, hire the one you guys like the least. Rick, the that, most, that most Rick, felt you know, most friction the, the, in that the, process. That's one that's going to cause the most friction that whenever, you know, because Mary, who everyone loved, she was finishing sentences that you had. Like in the case study, in the hypothetical, they think just like you, they answer just like you. Every answer was what all six and current employees like. Bob at the bottom or Jose or whoever it may be, didn't agree. Didn't agree. And can you imagine that that debrief session at the end of the day that we've all been through? Where like, can you believe Bob? He was fighting me on everything. He thinks so differently. He would never fit in here. So Ben, the reality is today, hiring is completely subjective. It is completely discriminatory. Throwing data at it will finally allow you to have at the end of the process, a much more diverse thinking group, whether it's all African-Americans, all Hispanics, like a few of here or there, it, it's besides those things that you actually will guarantee the most diversity of thinking and therefore change to a culture of diversity because you're just open to having differences. All right, good. We hit that one hard, but I think recruiting is the one that most people think about first, right? And that's where we have the most opportunity to, to, to leverage this and make the changes. Because once they're in the door, we can only modify things so much. We can only make so many and, changes. And quite frankly, recruiting is where individual assessments, personality tests, were just easiest. You'd pick up a piece of paper and say, okay, Steve or Mary, this is their profile. Let me look at them. What do we need? And you make that decision, okay? Mm -hmm. But with analytics and technology, you can now take those insights to the second piece I think you're headed towards, which is culture as a service and culture management for the existing population. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Being able to connect those, connect in and see how do they fit with the rest of the team? What gaps do they fill for us? Do we have the right coverage across the things that are important to us as the company? Those kinds of insights are, are super powerful. And again, having a, a PDF or a paper report on someone that you get spit out from some, we love our IO psychs here, but you get that from some psychologist and you're like, okay, how do we can't compare these things. So we can't merge them together. We can't see them in any sort of actionable way. And that's a pain point for a lot of companies because it's again, it's static, keep using that, that word is the best one to describe that. And it just doesn't allow you to take action on it necessarily. It's just, oh, there's the data point and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. The move to software as a service and taking in a, uh, psychometrics and putting it into a platform. That's the biggest transformation that, that we're having with companies is we've taken these individual tools called personality tests. And instead of saying, let's put that to, onto an app because that's what most personality tests have done the last five years, it still doesn't really help. We actually built a platform found the tool to fit into that platform, but the platform was built with the unifying view of culture starts with hiring. It goes to managing all the way to the exit. We've connected the whole life cycle of the employee where now disparate silo groups actually can now all use the same information to keep that life cycle going, whether you're hiring, onboarding, career mobility within your career at a company to find the right place you should work at. That example I gave you before of the 7-Eleven and Quick Trip, I worked in retail. I managed tens of thousands of employees running stores. And as much as your company thinks that they have a culture in their company, a lot of performance it really is based on the boss of the store manager and the employees. And so you could have in one store A in Miami, Florida, let's say 10 employees, eight people loving that job and that boss and that culture and two being miserable. What happens today? They get fired. Oh, they didn't fit here. 
Imagine you push a button in a platform that says, where would these two people fit culturally? Oh, there's a store 20 minutes away that's actually even closer to their house where they would actually get along with the team and the manager because culturally they're a fit based on the data. And then you can internally move them. And instead of losing two highly trained people who are miserable, you now can fill roles in another store and have to not go through the process of continuing this vicious cycle of turnover and hiring. So internal career mobility, also culture will play a huge piece in that. Awesome. So I'm glad you touched on that one. I'll, I'll keep going. Cause I, I, I could, again, we could dive just deep into this for all day long. If, if I let us, so onboarding, we get somebody in, we're bringing them on culture, right there, who we, what we know about them tells us probably how we should be connecting with them, what sort of way they're going to want to learn and grow as they're getting into this role and how they want to connect socially with people around them. Right? What kind of insights could a, could a, tool like you're talking about here, right? How, what sort of insights could that give me about around Juan as I'm bringing you onto the team to understand, okay, how do I know how he wants to start picking up his new skills to be effective here? How do I know how to start helping him build relationships, things like that? So here is the team, the manager, and then let's say, let's say that this employee here, Scott, is a new employee. Okay. That not only the manager can quickly see his or her personas and what that means out of 20 psychometric personas, we, 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 he's an improviser, info maverick. It quickly gamifies and shows Scott and the manager this listing is that he, we're 38. So we're only 38% similar. That means we're really different. So I, as the leader, can get a side by side, not only a downloadable, but on any device, even if you're a store employee or manufacturing site employee on my mobile, you can see that similarity score, a summary of how to onboard them. You can see the differences in the archetypes and then it will call out specifically for let's say the behavioral traits that are different. It shows that I am extremely stability oriented. All of mine are to the left and he is extremely change oriented. And so it shows some caution flags. Again, our, a platform should never say there's good or bad. We are all made by God to be perfect, complete and whole. We're just different. And so even though I, in this case, am the boss, I need to change and adapt to him sometimes and vice versa. So it gives little tips on if he's decisive, I'm deliberate, where that can show up at work and create friction. This just reduces that friction. Same with him being outgoing, me being reflective, all the way across these three areas of behaviors, motivators, and work styles. For example, I'm my value system is really around being of service here and being innovative here. I'm very knowledge-based. I like information. He's very practical. That could lead to some problems. So that's how the boss could onboard the person better. That same person can then look themselves and see how they fit with the team. So they can say, how am I similar or different to the team? So they can look at this report and say, okay, I'm at a high level. Half the team is similar to me and half the team is not. Let's go look where I'm really different. So in terms of deliberate versus decisive, the team is here and Scott's here, both directionally the same way, both change oriented, not really a difference. So it doesn't really call out. All these compliments means that they're very similar, right? So compliment. So on these 28 attributes, Scott is very similar with the team. But now if you look at a couple things, where is Scott not, not similar? Where could there be friction? Here's one under value systems. Scott is extreme influencer. The team is more over here on supporting. And so the team might perceive him as a little bit selfish or into his own activities. And he might have to do a little more effort to work with these people who are extreme supporting. They're going to wonder why, for example, this person, Jonathan Payton, Scott would want to reach out to Jonathan a little bit more than just when business needs it to be, because Jonathan's like a more supporting team member. So you can go through and see where there's similarities and where there's differences all the way to the bottom. Another big difference. I think that was the biggest difference. Scott's also really spontaneous, changes focus quickly. So that could cause friction with these guys over here, Carrie and Ian, who don't like that kind of quick change. They're a lot more steady, extremely steady. And even this person here, me. <laughs> so actually I've had that problem. Scott's all over the place sometimes. And I've had to understand that about him. He's not trying to be a pain. I need to understand that's just his style. He likes changing direction quickly. And then I feel like a drain on him because I'm so slow to approve things that he wants to do. So we both have to understand those differences. So that's how the person's different with the team. Now let's say they want to see how they're different with the future culture. Let's say the team's in the middle of a new culture. So you can also set a future culture for the team and, and see where is Scott 
where is Scott on this? You can see where Scott is and how similar or different he is with that target future culture. And so here's a future culture and you could see where there's a gap. He would wanna work on where he's extremely different from the target and what that means. So I'll stop there. Those are just some really tactical data-driven reporting around differences and similarities of a new employee for the boss employee relationship for peer to peer side by side, as well as with comparisons with the team. Yeah, I, I actually grabbed some of those, some of the different phrases and things you're using there to describe the different, the spectrums, the ranges that someone could be on because any of those, again, to start applying to other areas of, of talent, not just onboarding, right? how we're getting them in the door and how we're helping them get up to speed, but things like ongoing retention activities. I, I, Think I immediately go to things like right engagement surveys, how we're asking people questions, stay interviews. We're doing those to try to understand what's going on with people, even rewards, right? How people want to be recognized and rewarded for their efforts, depending on where they are on the, the different spectrum, different options there that you laid out. Someone is a little more focused on self-reliance or focused on helping. They may respond differently to one of those conversations or they may be more open and, and willing to share versus the other side where someone's, I need more time to think about this. I, I need to, let me consume this and respond back later. Like the, all that, all those different kinds of approaches and different ways of thinking affect how we deliver those. And yet for most companies, it's peanut butter spread. We're going to yep. apply the same things to everybody. And we end up serving some people. They get the benefit, they get the results that they're looking for, those kind of things. But for the other people, we're telling them that how they're different, the things that the, the way they think, if it's not, exactly in line with whatever that norm is, that average, we tell them that doesn't matter to us. Yeah, you're hitting on the huge transformation in the business world. As consumers, we all ingest really seamless, fun software and technology and entertainment. And what is it being based on? Personalization. When I'm on Netflix, I don't have to see 10 million titles. They just present <laughs> what I like. HR and the way companies communicate with employees is gonna be based on personalization training and development. How do I learn? L&D department today trains all employees on any topic the same way and worse. Before it was like, oh, there's the e-library, go figure it out. At least now they're doing more workshops and things. But if it's a group of 10 people that you're training as L&D and that group are all extreme, let's say that group, let's say the group of L&D is the, the group that you're training is extremely creative. So let's say you have a team and that team that you're training are all creative. Let's say instead of having some people work that, let's say everybody was over here. Wouldn't you train a group of people that are extremely creative, who don't like structure, don't like predictability, don't like proven methods. Wouldn't you train them differently if they were creative? Yeah, mm -hmm. so like training is one area where it's gonna become personalized and knowing the psychology of how people learn and how they like to digest information is gonna be really clear. That's one example. Personalization and training in L&D is really important. Another area that's going to be really important, and you touched on it, is rewards. In terms of rewards, today, people, if you're going to bonus people, let's give them all money. But some people don't respond to money. Let's look at the different ways that now with data, you can see someone might want fame. Like for them, getting their name on the corporate newsletter or on the website, you don't have to pay them a dollar. Paying them $500 doesn't make them feel good. Get, getting their name to be well known does. Somebody wants personal development. So instead of money, they don't have to do with that. Give them a $200 certificate for an online training course because they want to get developed. Advancement. Make it very clear that their, their, their reward for doing well in that task is that they're not going to get closer to promotion in the next study. So all these different things, friendship, like the loyalty, like all of these things are different ways that companies can now use psychometrics and culture management to optimize things like rewards, to optimize things like training and development. There's so many things you can do with psychometrics now that's in a platform, now yes. that it's accessible at any moment, at your fingertips, at any level. It's no longer the consultant, the workshops who are gonna help you with a personality test, okay? It is something that you consume daily in emails, in Outlook, in Microsoft Teams. Absolutely. That's what's so exciting to me because every time I talk to you, I think of yet another use case, another example, another place to embed that because in my head, I had a couple already on the tip of my tongue, but in our kind of warm up before we started recording a few minutes ago, you mentioned rewards. I'm like, absolutely. Yes. We used to use, I used to use that as a strategic kind of way to connect people that I knew that I knew were maybe on the bubble about how they felt about their job, whatever else. I'm like, okay, I'll, we'll find the lever for them and we'll use this moment that they're, they do something great to make sure that they know we don't just 
care about them, but we care about them specifically for what yes. they, the way they want to be cared. Per- personalized cared for. rewards. It's, yes. So one of our, one of our advisors early on was Ed Renzi, the CEO of McDonald's for 17 years. And he and his wife, son, he, they gave him a franchise of 10 restaurants in the Midwest. And so he had been trying to get people to change their behavior in the stores for like five years through money. Hey, if you do these things, I'll pay you more. Do you really think he wasn't giving them $10,000, like $400 a year there? These 17, 18 year olds who he was hiring didn't want that. They wanted career development and they wanted recognition. So, using our tool, he saw that those were the two things that vibrated the most for these young 16, 18 year olds. So, he basically put a, a whiteboard where every week they had the winners of three different contests around tasks he wanted them to do. And then he also then paid for, I think, $1,000 a month for the top winner to do training to become a better human being, right? Like self development, coursework. And literally he changed the performance of all 10 stores based on the simple, how he recognized and rewarded people, not by money, but by these two other things. It was the most powerful example we've ever had today. That is so much fun. I love that. I, I talked to a young man this, this last week that he got me fired up because he's just really passionate about his career. And he's finally found where he's supposed to be. And one of the things he, he was talking about is like, he gets the chance that he gets a chance right now, early on this leadership program he's in to start meeting with other leaders in the business and learning from them kind of one-on-one. And again, I could have, you could have said, Hey, we're going to start you out in this job or whatever else, but he is more excited about being a trainee in that role because he's getting the chance to tap into the expertise of all these different leaders. And again, it's just a way of, I love the example there and some of the others you share because every single level, every single layer, there's a chance to weave these things in. And at the end of the day, just understanding your people. There's a, one of my favorite it's not published anymore, but one of the old like web comics that was for business leaders years ago. One of the ones that sticks out in my head is this, this employee, this manager comes to his supervisor and says, Hey, I've done a generational analysis and found out what my employees need. And his manager says, you have six of them. Why don't you just you know, ask them what they need? And <laughs> it's, we want to go, we want to avoid understanding our people for some reason in the past. It was, there, that was a, there was a hurdle. Now we have the tools. There's no excuse for not using these kinds of things to really get at the root of who people are and what they need. And if I used to work for a, a phenomenal leader, I still respect her highly to this day because she could see that spider sense. She could have sent something going on from an HR perspective that can go in and figure out what it was to get to the bottom of it. But even with that amazing ability that I've never been able to replicate, she couldn't know people as well as right. they can be known with a tool like this. Right. You can't see scalable. that level. Right, you no. can't see it at that level. Um, no. And by the way, that brings another example around giving that, that leader you just talked about, that mm-hmm. intuition she had. Imagine if everybody gets that intuition, but fed to them. So I'm going to just show one other great applicability of this. We call this EQ everyone. If you notice in Outlook, in Microsoft Teams, in Slack, in any communications, we have a plugin where you can literally on the page of the ribbon at a, on a tool, you can mm-hmm. get H, HT, human intelligence and these EQ insights. And so when you write an email, um, to somebody at your company, you can literally click on the button and then click on their name in the email and it'll pop up these insights right there in the email on what that person's personas are, how to communicate with them, how to influence them, how to motivate them. And if you're training them, what their learning style is, or if you're onboarding them right there in emails, in Outlook, in Chrome, in Slack, in any communication tool. In addition, you can look at a big meeting coming up and imagine now for the first time ever looking at meetings by the lens of a culture. We all look at people in a meeting you're going to today through LinkedIn. Okay, where did they work? Who am I meeting with? What did they do? The what you've done is only 30% predictive in collaboration and performance. Now you can click on one button before you walk into the meeting as a leader, as a participant, and see across these things that, that psychometrics measure, behaviors, motorized work styles, this BMW framework, you can see who on the meeting is really shy. So to be more inclusive as a leader, why don't you call on the shy people first if you're asking questions? But you can see who's really decisive that if you give action items and, and things to do for the next morning overnight, these are the ones who will take pleasure in doing that, where someone who's really deliberate probably wouldn't enjoy that. You can see who's the one who could do a five-hour competitive analysis because they love reading and studying independently. That's our chief scientist in this example, a guy named Russ. You can see, for instance, if you're delivering training, that this group is all creative. Or if you're just in part of a meeting and they're all creative and you're the one structured person, probably good to know that before you go into that meeting. These are all really powerful ways that psychometrics through a platform 
is transformational because now everyone can be like that leader you just described. Yes. Everyone doesn't have to have a psychology degree. Everyone can better understand, then connect, communicate, and collaborate. That leads to a higher vibration of performance and collaboration throughout a company, and even more so remote, because now you're not even working in the same office now. I feel like that's like a mic drop moment, that quote right there. I'll have to pull that for the teaser for the episode, because that was tremendous. I love that. I'm imagining if, number one, again, I, I'd forgotten about that experience with one of my leaders, but like I always wish I had that ability, and this would give me that ability. And you wish, we always wish some of the other people around us might have a little more self-awareness. This <laughs> give them give them awareness, not just themselves, but everybody else so they can understand yes. and have some better relationships overall. At the end of the day, all of our research, all of the things that we've done, all the studies we've done, when you look at the history of work, okay, as long as it's been around, when automation happens and automation disruption, it's the reality today. But as automation happens, the work that's left behind if that way passes is more human in nature. It's more relationship focused. It's more connected on the people side. And tools like this, it seems like a paradox, right? Can we use technology to be more focused on the humans? But absolutely we can. And that's what excites me because the, the importance of being being more relational, being more connected, being more supportive of each other. You used three words a minute ago. Were they collaborative or those three? Yeah, so you need to understand before you can connect, communicate, and collaborate. Connect, communicate, and collaborate, right? Those things are going to become increasingly important as automation disrupts what we do overall in the workplace, both in HR and outside. And it's so exciting to think that we have tools that can help us to be more focused, more targeted, more tailored to the people that we serve. So this has been this has been so much fun, Juan. If someone wants to learn more about human intelligence, the, the amazing work that you and the team are doing, again, I already mentioned, I'll make sure and get the link to the other episode because you've enjoyed Juan's conversation today. You'll enjoy that one as well. He tells some great stories. That you, that's one thing I appreciate about you. If someone wants to connect more, wants to learn more about what you're up to, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, they can reach me at my email uh, directly if they want. I, I Give me 24 hours to respond, but my email is juan at humanintelligence.com. And you'll list our website, humanintelligence.com. So uh, feel free to reach out. I liked how you put it best, Ben. Technology can make work more human. Our HR software does not automate processes. It infuses emotional intelligence, EQ, throughout a company from the CEO down to the janitor at every type of company in the world, large, small, every industry. And it, it will transform people want to be happy at work and connect better like they do in their personal life. And we're leading the charge and trying to make that vision. I'm so excited. I'm so, I'm honored to know you, sir. And, and the great work that you and the team are doing. I, you said you kept up with the show. I've kept up with you because I'm just excited about what you're accomplishing. So thank you again for hanging out with us. I appreciate you. And to everybody else listening in, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ben Eubanks and we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.